Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. You're about to hear part one of a two-part special episode on breast screening. And we thought before we start things proper, Dr. Travis Brown, we really should thank Dr. Sandy Mink because she really has been, I mean, normally you're the puppet master. She's been the puppet master for this one, hasn't she? She contacted us and said, uh, I've listened to your podcast. Have you thought about doing breast screen? And and the hard thing about pulling this all together is getting so many working levers, but she has really been instrumental. And we looked at it and we realised how useful this kind of an episode or t- double episode would be. And so we wanted to say thank you, uh, Sandy, for helping us pull this together. I think just from our discussions with our guests, this will be a really useful episode for GPs and for patients about learning about breast screen. Dr. Travis Brown, what is this medical life all about? This is the pursuit of knowledge as we learn about diseases from the ancient times to the present day. These are the stories of medicine. Dr. Travis Brown, we're talking breast screening this episode and next. Um, But of course, breast cancer, which is trying to look for is um, close to so many people. I've lost my mother-in-law to this. I've got friends who have survived breast cancer. You don't have to scratch very deeply to find a connection with almost every family. That's the amazing thing about breast cancer is how prevalent it is. And if we actually look just at the top five cancers, looking at Australia, we the actual top five cancers, or even Australia, United Kingdom, uh, the US, Well, let's say the top four is lung, bowel, breast, and prostate. And with Australia, if you add in melanoma, that accounts for 60% of the cancers that we have. If you just have lung, bowel, breast, and prostate, that's about 50% of the cancers. And if you extend that to worldwide, you include lung, bowel, liver, stomach, and breast. They're the top five cancers that we have in the modern day society. And the amazing thing about this is when you go to the history books, breast cancer is actually really prevalent in the history books. Really? It is. It was quite surprising when I was doing all the research. And then you realize, well, all the other cancers, excluding melanoma, Mm. are internal organs. So it wasn't until you got to the age of investigation autopsies when people started to realize, oh, you get tumors and cancers everywhere that it was the the nature of breast cancer, it's superficial. Right. So even though breast cancers aren't necessarily mentioned through history, you can deduce. No, no, it's mentioned. Oh. It's mentioned. And we will mention that today. <laughs> wow. uh, and, and some of the quotes coming up. And this is the thing. Breast cancer, if you want to say in, in this, is overrepresented in history books mm. because of the nature of it is it's actually superficial and people can see that there is something wrong. There right. is a disease process happening here. Whereas all the others, you wouldn't have known that until it was very advanced and then you wouldn't have even known that that was the reason that someone had colon cancer and so if we look and this is this is a thing even today we look back in the history books you look at other types of cancers things can be of controversy we have the scythian king who died four thousand years ago well we know he died of breast cancer because of molecular techniques on his bones that shows us he had prostate cancer if we look at napoleon in the 1800s it's even gastric cancer is even controversial that uh, was it really gastric cancer the thickening of the lining and then melanoma is the 1800s when we started to understand that but if we go back we can see the earliest record of of breast cancer is in ancient Egypt. And this is from the the Edwin Smith papyrus, case 45, that talks about tumours of the anterior chest. And if they say if it's it's cool to touch, if it's bulging, or if it is spread over the breast, no treatment can help. And so Mm. if we go to the Greeks, we have a Teus of Amida, who's in the 5th and 6th century, who writes... 
Breast cancer appears mainly in women and rarely in men. The tumour is painful because of the intense traction of the nipple. Avoid operating when the tumour has taken over the entire breast and adhered to the thorax. But if the scirrhous tumour begins at the edge of the breast and spreads in more than half of it, we must try to amputate the breast without cauterization. And so we have Paulus of Argentia. Now, he wrote seven books on medicine. This was two centuries later. And book six, he states, Cancer occurs in every part of the body, but it is more frequent in the breasts of women. If you ever attempt to cure cancer by operation, begin your evacuations by purging the melancholic humour and having cut away the whole affected part so that a root of it be left, permit the blood to be discharged and to not speedily restrain it, but squeeze the surrounding veins so as to force out the thick parts of the blood and then cure the wound like other ulcers. And so this is what you're seeing from those quotes. This is the four humours parts of our medical journey. And this is where disease about it is imbalance. And this is how we, we have the bile, black bile, we have phlegm. And all of that is disease is caused by an imbalance of these humours. And so that's why you're hearing about them talking. And again, this is pre-anesthetic. So you're talking about pretty tough surgery. And then to let it drain out to actually let the humours become balanced again. And so the, the important part of here is cancer occurs in every part, but is more frequent in the breasts of women. And again, yes. that's just that nature is because it was just far more evident to people that don't have access to internal organs by imaging or any, any other means. And so at this time, cancer is referred to as a gnawing wolf. Mm. And so the way that this was interpreted was it was devouring its victims. And so this is even the reason why sometimes some of the old remedies was you would place raw meat onto the affected area where there was cancer to try and divert the, the cancer. Yes. I mean, look, the analogy is good, the gnawing wolf. I think that's quite effective. It's when they go too far and that then... Suggest. Well, this is this is just trying anything to try, you know, divert this cancer, this gnawing wolf, to to devour this raw meat as opposed to the the, the yeah. organs, and and this was the the part, and even even we get to the point where Paulus, Paulus noted that breast cancer, that lymph nodes could be involved. And if it was in the axilla, ah. then they would recommend poppy extract to help, to help with the pain. And so they actually really knew quite well this disease process that was going. And, and this is why in the 16 and 1700s, you get quite a bit of writing about surgical techniques. Again, it's without anesthetic. So it's also one of those parts that this was the time that that physicians and surgeons were probably emboldened by uh, the amount of wars and their amputation techniques. Uh, right. And, and yes. so you get descriptions about things like forceps and knives, cauterization, and patients being held down. There's one account where a patient explains how they were held down by seven men for this oh. this operation to take place and again won't go into the the details but there are some harrowing accounts but yeah in and, and this is um, surprisingly a patient survived the ordeal but it, it is hard to know how many and in the 17th century we don't have accurate records of how many people survived but there was a a skilled surgeon from the 17th century Daniel Turner who kept pretty accurate records but when he was excising tumors about 30% of his patients died. And and this, again, it was a time of no germ theory and no yeah. antibiotics. But this was around the time when the scientific revolution was happening. And this is where four humours began to be challenged. And Galen with his black bile. And black bile was thought to be the cause of cancer. But we're also getting into a, a sort of a... An unusual time. This is experimental medicine. <laughs> right. And so there was a French physician, Jean Astruct, and he set out to prove or disprove this theory that black bile caused cancer. So he got 
cooked slices of beef mm -hmm. and cooked slices of breast cancer. And he compared the flavour of the two oh. and concluded that there was no appreciable difference between the two. Therefore, black bile did not cause cancer. I just need a moment to process that. Well, here's the here's the well odd thing about this is first <laughs> of all, yeah, there's more. A, well, when you look at it, you go, well, black bile causing cancer. Well, it's a, it's a wrong theory, and he decided to test it by tasting it. So he had the wrong theory tested by a wrong experiment, and yet found out that the correct answer that breast cancer isn't caused by black bile. So this is one of those cases where two wrongs actually does make a right. Oh, so it is then, not to be outdone, the English surgeon James Noose. Actually, before you go further, he is a forerunner of today's conspiracy theorist <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> well, we have English surgeon James Noose, who then wanted to prove that breast cancer was an infective. And so he took breast cancer and he injected it into his arm. Right. And so fortunately, he was right. Yeah. It's not transferable. It's not contagious. With all of that, that brings us into the 20th century. And, and this is when we get X-rays have been discovered by, in Germany by Rodigen in 1895, just before the 20th century. And about 20 years later, so in 1913, Albert Salomon is a German surgeon, and he wrote a paper called Contributions to the Pathology in Clinical Medicine of Breast Cancer, where he performed 3,000 mammograms on mastectomy specimens. 3,000? And so, well, German, so I'm guessing that's probably... <laughs> Efficiency, <fits. laughs> yes. And so, with looking at that, found that he demonstrated you could see spread going through to the axilla at that time. Now, this mm -hmm. is just based on that the x-rays and the reporting. The first patients to have mammograms were in 1927. And in 1930, radiologist Stafford Warren began to start to recommend x-rays or mammograms on both breasts to be able to compare the results to better accuracy. And then we start to see this progression of understanding. It wasn't the probably the biggest part was radiologist Gerhon Cohen and pathologist Helen Ingleby teamed up to start to correlate their findings in the 20th century. And they really increased the knowledge and understanding of lesions that they could find on the mammogram, as well as then subsequently on histology. That's almost 100 years ago. Well, and, and that's right. In 1950s, Raul Leborn, a radiologist, started highlighting features such as breast patterns, microcalcifications, benign versus malignant features. And it's not until we really come until the 1970s, though, that we start to see the budding of breast screening. And a radiologist from New York named Philip Strax argued that women needed mammograms who did not have any physical signs or symptoms of <sighs> breast cancer. He went on to research. He had teamed up with a, a private insurance company, and they got 60,000 women between the ages of 40 and 64, and they separated them into two groups, a control group and an ex ex interventional or experimental group. And they followed them up for four years, and the intervention group had a reduced mortality of 30%. Gee. Now, this, the, the interesting part of this was the participation in that intervention group was only about 46% people turning up. So it's not until we start to get 1980s, 1988 Malmo screening trial got 21,000 women in two different groups, control and intervention, and they found that women between the ages of 43 and 69 could have a reduced mortality rate of 20% with this screening. Now, the participation rate here is about 70%. Okay. And we get into the late 80s and early 90s, and we get two studies, the Swedish Two Country and the Stockholm Trials, where thousands of women are trialed, and again, what they find is greater than a 30% mortality reduction in the intervention group, and we've got women participating at over 80%. The understanding is starting to go through. 
Mm. And then we get into the 1990s, and this is where you've got reporting of mammograms. This is starting to be standardized. So we have BIRADS, which is breast imaging reporting and data system. So this is to, to have consistent reporting techniques for radiologists and for people who are using the mammograms. And we'll discuss a little bit later with some of our guests. And this is the point behind this. Now, why is breast screening so important? And the reason is, and I'm pretty sure everyone listening will understand this, the larger the size of the malignancy, the increased risk it has of metastasizing. And so this is what we're needing to prevent. And so if we look at the size, if we have a breast cancer between 1 to 10 millimeter, the chance of it having a distant metastasis at diagnosis is 0.5%. Right. If we go to 10 to 20 millimeter, it has a distant metastasis risk at diagnosis of 2.5%. Um, whoa, that's many orders of magnitude. And then if we go up to 90 to 100 millimeter, about 26%. So one quarter of them will have metastases at diagnosis. And if we go over 100 millimeters, it's about 33% or one third. And so this is, and now when we're looking at staging, again, metastases is a significant component. And if we get distant metastases, then that's a very high stage. And this will affect prognosis and, and long-term survivability. And this is the value of early detection. This is the reason why we're visiting breast cancer and breast screening today. Associate Professor Michelle Reintholz is an Australian radiologist and has specialised in breast imaging, having undertaken fellowships at Breast Green South Australia and observerships and sabbaticals in breast MRI imaging at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in New York City, uh, Brigham Hospital Boston, Curie Institute Paris and the Brussels Screening Programme. Michelle's worked in both public and private breast practices in South Australia and Australia in both clinical, educational and administrative capacities and is the clinical director of Breast Green South Australia. Associate Professor Reintals is our guest today on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much, Steve and Travis, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this important podcast session. Our pleasure. Now, the very first thing I'd like to ask is if you can just tell us about Breast Green SA and, and the work that it does. Certainly. Um, look, I'm really proud to be part of, of Breast Screen SA. I have worked here on and off since 2004, since doing my fellowship here, both as a radiologist and, and more recently as clinical director. It's a wonderful atmosphere. We employ about 250 staff, predominantly women, of course, because that's the service that we provide for women. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's an amazing place in that most of the staff that come here and, and work here never leave. Um, so culturally, it's, it's a great place. We have uh, a number of administrative staff and we have a number of clinical staff and, and we all work fairly closely together. We offer um, screening services to women in the community. Our target age group is the 50 to 74 year old age group, but we do, however, accept women from the age of 40 and onwards and also beyond 74. Um, we just don't actively invite those women between 40 and 49 and once they turn 75, but they are still welcome to, to attend our clinics. Um, we have 11 screening clinics, which um, are both fixed and mobile. So we have three mobile units that travel around the countryside in our regional and, and remote areas. And per annum here in SA, we screen about 95,000 women, and that's in, in that target age group. So it's, it's a, a large number of women, and, and certainly we would always like to capture more of, of the community. There are a number of women who choose to either not be screened or, or to screen elsewhere. But the program, if I may explain, we, as I said, we screen 95,000 women. We recall pro approximately 
five to 6,000 women a year to our assessment clinic, which is also uh, located within the breast screening unit. Uh, but that's centrally, and currently we're located at, at Flinders Street, but we will we'll be moving within the CBD to uh, Wakefield Street in the next month or two to our, our new fresh premises, which is wonderful. And of those women that do attend our uh, assessment unit, they undergo additional mammography and ultrasound and potentially biopsies as well. And we diagnose about 750 cancers a year here within breast screen. So with regards to the, the work that we do in our screening units, we provide screening every two years. And then there's a small number of women who fit into a high risk category that are eligible for annual screening as well. Mm -hmm. So with these, this is two yearly, is that the current guidelines for women to have mammography between 50 and 74? Yes, it is. Within Australia, it certainly is um, every two years, unless you are deemed to be of higher risk. Uh, and there are very specific guidelines around uh, those risk factors that then make a woman eligible for annual screening. Now, in researching this, there was the classification that we came across called BIRADS. Uh, is that yes. how these are classified for a mammography assessment? So um, there's certainly the, the classification of BIRADS, which is used externally predominantly in the private and, and public systems. Here in Breast Screen Australia, we use the TABAR and Nottingham system. So the, the TABAR system refers to a lesion classification, whether it be an abnormality seen on a mammogram that may be a stellate lesion, calcifications, a mass, multiple masses, architectural distortion, non-specific densities. And then depending on that actual lesion, they undergo additional imaging. And then the outcome of that additional imaging is then characterised based on our TABAR classification as to whether it is uh, no abnormality, in which case it's given a, one, a score of one. If it is considered benign, so for example, a cyst or, or just a normal looking tissue, uh, it's given a two. And then if we deem it to be what, what's called indeterminate, meaning we think it's most likely, you know, 98% likely to be benign. Um, that's given a, um, a score of three. And those women then undergo a biopsy. Uh, and then similarly, if there's a grade four, that's called suspicious, where it's most likely or 50% likely to be cancer. Uh, and, then by, and then the classification five, which is 98% likely to be cancer. And then very specific lesion types will often be characterised into that grading system. So a stellate lesion is typically a, a grade four or a grade five because of the, the pathology nature. And I know you're doing a discussion on, on in the podcast with pathology and hence the importance of correlating the radiology and the pathology together is why here at Breast Screen we work in a very multidisciplinary team environment and all of the cases that go to biopsy in our assessment clinic will be reviewed in an MDT setting where there's um, a surgeon, a medical officer and a radiologist. And then we obviously have the pathology um, outcome as well. So we correlate all of that together. So looking at or doing the math uh, with regards to about 94,000 mammography, about 700 positive results. So is that about right? That's almost sort of a bit less than 1% positive of breast screen uh, results coming through? Yes, that's correct. That's with the actual diagnosis of cancer. Of course, there are a number of women who also have abnormal results that will end up going for open biopsy and they may have atypical results which then put them in a higher risk category of, of breast cancer and they then enter our annual screening uh, group as well. That is that is a small number, but yes, that is correct, less than 1%. Mm. Uh, now, you mentioned some of the other imaging studies. So there is screening mammography, but there is diagnostic mammography. Can you tell us what the difference is between these two? Yeah, certainly. So with breast screen, we are obviously a, a screening program for the general population. Women that attend breast screen must not have symptoms. So no lump, 
um, specific nipple discharge, so blood stained, dark, and uh, also clear. So there, there are particular questions that we will ask women when they ring up to book or if they fill in our online uh, forms that also has that information as well. Um, some of the services have online forms and, and others do not within Australia, but it's certainly a, a move towards that, which makes it a lot more seamless for women. With regards to why we don't encourage women with symptoms to come to breast screen, it's essentially a screening program to diagnose very early breast cancer. And the prognosis, the outcome for those women is much, much better because their cancers are picked up very small. So the vast majority of our cancers are DCIS, so they're pre-invasive where they're still within the ducts, or they're in fact stage one where they're small cancers and no nodes involved. So um, as soon as a woman becomes symptomatic with a breast cancer, the outcome for her long-term prognosis is, is worse for the reason that um, a breast cancer has, if you look at a graph, a, a sojourn, a, a journey, if you like, mm. and as soon as it, it tips over into that clinically evident stage, the outcome is worse. They tend to have a larger cancer, they tend to have nodes involved, and therefore, as a result, the higher the stage, um, the, the worse the prognosis. And so for that reason, we decline women with breast symptoms, uh, very specific breast symptoms. And it is very important that they have imaging that then falls into what we call the diagnostic um, realm. And that's where they actually have not just a screening mammogram, but they actually have a mammogram with an ultrasound and potentially a biopsy. And they also need to see either a breast physician, their GP or a surgeon, so that they can then look at the clinical side of things. So we refer to that as the clinical test. And that's where the clinical, the pathology and the imaging all marry up so that someone doesn't you know, slip through the gaps, if you like, because not everything shows up on mammography, not everything shows up on ultrasound, and not everything is clear cut clear cut clinically and so all of that information needs to be put together so that's ultimately the difference between screening and diagnostic the category you mentioned was a high risk category as well previously uh, is that just a one all or is there there are different fields of high risk such as brca one and two or just high risk genes is it all one high risk everyone gets an annual screen or is there layers to that yeah, there, absolutely, there are layers to that, and um, it's a very complicated area, and it's a, an evolving, growing area. Um, it's quite an exciting time to be um, in breast cancer imaging in general because we're just learning new stuff all the time. If I think about when I started out doing breast imaging, gosh, do I, do I say 20 <laughs> plus years ago, um, one in 12 women got breast cancer. Well, now it's one in seven. And breast cancer treatments have improved. Our screening techniques, we now have other options available to us for women who are in the high risk category. So you mentioned the BRCA gene. Um, there are women who are now eligible for breast MRI who fit into that high risk. And <clears throat> it's, it's important that one characterises the specific risk based on the genetic profile, based on the mammographic appearance, um, the breast density, et cetera. It's, it, it's, it's a big picture and it's also about family history and lifestyle factors and, you know, all of those other things we don't like to talk about that influence breast cancer risk, alcohol, exercise, um, smoking, HRT, um, you know, first age of pregnancy, so on and so forth. It's, it's a very large area. And so, no, it's not a one size fits all. And for that reason, you'll find that each state and territory, you know, jurisdiction within Breast Screen Australia generally has the same rules with regards to 
um, annual screening. The family history is, is, is quite straightforward, but there may be some little nuances to the other genetic profiles that are coming through. Mm. Now, here in Breast Screen SA, we have a medical executive committee um, which meets sort of every quarter, if you like, and um, we we review those types of scenarios. So we often get letters from specialists or from clients themselves who've had genetic profiling. And just as an example, you know, the CHECK2 mutation, we offer annual screening for the RAD51 um, C and D, we offer annual screening for. These are, are not prevalent in the community that we know about but of course not everybody has their genetic profiling done so it's probably a little bit of an untapped or an unknown area at this point we do know that that BRCA genes are, are not particularly common they're more common in the um, Ashkenazi Jew um, population but in the general population it's sort of 0.2 percent um, carry a BRCA gene mutation and um, we therefore offer annual screening for those women, that particular subgroup, but we also recommend that they have additional uh, review within a high-risk clinic outside where they literally undergo that very intensive screening where they have a breast surgeon that reviews them, they have a breast MRI annually, you know, if they decide to do a, a mammogram as well. So there are there are some groups that have more intensive screening than others in that annual group. There are also some groups that are of slightly higher risk uh, genetically, but not enough to require annual screening. And, you know, we take those on a case-by-case -case basis as that information is coming about. We do literature searches and uh, we discuss it with the specialists as well. So we uh, we make an informed decision based on that. <laughs> Looking at women who have a strong family history, but none of the positive uh, mutations, either they haven't had it tested or they have and it's negative, would you recommend a breast screen in those instances or would you say these people still need uh, further, more, more diagnostic kind of assessment? I, <clears throat> I think regardless of one's risk, Breast screen is a really safe place for a woman to have a mammogram. Um, the reason I say that is we have breast trained specialists here. Our radiographers um, are held accountable to a high standard of mammography positioning. So they are reviewed um, six monthly with what we call the PGMI score, where they have a series of mammograms evaluated that each radiographer has taken and then they're graded according to, you know, perfect for P, uh, M for moderate, uh, G for good and, and I for inferior. And thankfully we don't get too many inferiors. So yeah. that is actually really important because if a good mammogram is not taken, well, the radiologist doesn't have much hope of, of seeing anything decent on it. So that's the first important point. And then the second important point is that all our mammograms are double blind read. So that means two independent radiologists read blind to the other. And then where there is what we call discordance, so one reader might call an abnormality and the other one may not, it then goes to a third senior radiologist who then arbitrates. And so we also, as radiologists, receive our statistics every three months. I don't know any other area that receives their statistics in such a robust fashion. And I must admit, it's a very daunting time when you, you get that yellow envelope that's given to you and it, and it has your stats in there. And it literally has everything from your cancer detection rates to any potential missed cancers that you may have. And it also refers to what your recall rates are as well. So how many women are you recalling to breast screen in order to find that one cancer? And so we constantly have education. We constantly have feedback. It makes you a better radiologist. It has to, obviously, because you're learning. It's a, a very, very good setup so that you actually have quality control. So I think, you know, coming back to your original question, yes, there are without um, doubt high risk groups, but when it comes to mammography, breast screen is, is a very safe place to, to have your mammogram. And nothing, nothing is perfect, 
uh, in life, whether it be us as humans or whether it be the technology, all of that comes into play. Yeah, look, notwithstanding that point, it's still heartening to hear just that comprehensive approach taken at Breast Green SA. And perhaps just to draw us to the end for this conversation in this particular episode, are there any populations, Michelle, or any demographics that we're actually missing or, or perhaps are not as well represented with breast screening and mammography? Yeah, it's it's a frustration for all of us in, in Breast Screen Australia that, you know, we offer this great service for the general population, but there are some subgroups, um, ethnicities, um, culturally, you know, diverse groups that are very hard to reach. And I refer to the Indigenous groups the uh, called groups and the lower socioeconomic groups. And, you know, without question, we don't want to um, miss out on providing that service to them. We do have some very robust initiatives in place. Um, we have, we actually have employed here at Breast Screen SA um, a called an Indigenous officer who goes out to those hard to reach communities when the bus goes out there. So Marla, for example, and they have group sessions where they encourage women, uh, the Indigenous women, to attend the screening bus and they make a sort of day of it. We have education sessions and we obviously try and put things in specific languages to make it attractive, I suppose, to certain groups. And, you know, that's just, we've, we've got a whole comms and marketing team that, that concentrates on that. So it's very important to us to, to try and improve that. But fundamentally, we're dealing with communities that are hard to engage and are also remote and rural. And fundamentally, that's part of, of what the issue is. The interesting thing is that, you know, it is important for us to reach those communities because their participation is is quite poor with, with you know, respect to the, the rest of the population. But ironically, their outcomes are, are worse because they tend to present later to us. And therefore, as I explained before, you know, the prognosis is worse. The longer, further along that graph you are, the more advanced the cancer is. So... Yes, that is an area that we we always try to improve, and and that's a national a national uh, issue as well. Michelle, thank you for that background and that overview of the work of Breast Green SA. We'll pause there for now, but we're lucky to know that you'll join us in our next episode, this two part episode, uh, to go into some other territory related here. So, Associate Professor Michelle Reintholz, thanks for joining us on this episode of This Medical Life. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Travis. Associate Professor Wendy Raymond is an anatomical pathologist and cytopathologist working at ClinPath and SA Pathology at Flinders Medical Centre and is an Associate Professor at Flinders University of South Australia. She's been associated with Breast Green SA since 1998, both as a visiting consultant cytopathologist and in her current role as pathologist head of unit. Associate Professor Raymond is a past president of the Australasian Society of Breast Disease and of the Australian Society of Cytology and has been actively involved in national breast cancer reporting guidelines, implementation of HER2 assessment and quality assurance committees and is currently chair of the Breast Pathology Quality Assurance Committee of the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia. Associate Professor Raymond has a particular interest and expertise in breast and endocrine histopathology, fine needle aspiration and general cytopathology and has published widely in these areas, including co-editing the recent IAC Yokohama system for reporting breast fine needle aspiration biopsy cytopathology. Associate Professor Wendy Raymond is our guest today on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Wendy, let us begin. Uh, what are the, the common samples pathologists receive from breast screen patients? Generally, we will receive core biopsy specimens and also some fine needle aspiration biopsy specimens, which are being performed by the radiologists at breast screen. When we're looking at these samples, now you, you've mentioned fine needle aspirate, normally abbreviated to FNA. Can you tell us 
when do we get FNA specimens or, or for from breast key, breast screen patients? Well, occasionally they're performed for breast lesions, which are most typically cysts. In the past, we used to receive them for a lot broader spectrum of diseases such as cancers and um, other solid lesions. But because of core biopsy being much more readily available now, we, we do predominantly form core for those cases. But still for lesions like cysts, um, fine needle aspiration is most appropriate. We also regularly perform them if uh, for auxiliary lymph nodes, uh, patients who have a breast cancer or suspected breast cancer, and if they've got an abnormal auxiliary lymph node, then a fine needle biopsy will be done of the node. Sometimes we also get them if there are multiple breast lesions. So they'll do a core biopsy on perhaps the largest or the most suspicious lesion. And then rather than subjecting the patient to multiple cores, uh, fine needle biopsy might be done on some of the, the other lesions that are identified. Just looking at cysts, are cysts in a sort of radiological sense and then an FNA sense, are they more likely to be benign than malignant or is, it, is there any really sort of rule of thumb? Yes, and most of them, and the radiologists are pretty good at picking that most of them will be benign lesions, but because there are some cancers that can mimic cysts and radiologically can be, uh, if you like, just a, um, a, a different form of cancer, and these particularly some like mucinous carcinomas, then it's important to always stick a needle in it just to make sure that you're actually dealing with a cyst and you're not missing one of these subtle, often special types of carcinoma. For example, a mucinous carcinoma will have a lot of background mucin material, which is of a similar texture to a cyst. So therefore, it can kind of fool the radiologist into thinking that it's a similar lesion. When looking at an FNA, the results that you give the patient uh, or, or the doctor, is it just benign, suspicious, malignant, or what categories do, do they fall into? I mean, essentially, with most cytology specimens, and, and including breast, we'll try and put them into one of five categories, which will be benign, atypical, which means it's probably benign, but it's got a few features which may, are a little bit worrying, suspicious where we're actually quite concerned it's cancer, but we haven't got quite enough features to call it definitely cancer or malignant. So they're the essential categories. There is also a category of unsatisfactory or insufficient where we don't have enough material to actually make a definite call. Looking at then biopsies, what, what lesions get biopsies done for them? Well, there's a broad range of lesions. <laughs> biopsy. You're talking, we're talking now about core biopsies, are you? Yeah. I mean, essentially, whenever there's a suspicion of cancer, uh, so any density or mass lesion which is identified in the breast, and the other one we commonly receive specimens for are for calcifications. Calcifications are readily identified on radiology and particularly if they're new compared to a previous mammogram, they're of concern because a proportion of these will be associated with malignancy. Uh, a lot of them are benign as well, so it's for reassurance that that's what we're dealing with, but there are some of them which are extremely difficult radiologically to distinguish benign from malignant, so we'll receive cores on those. So is that the difference between a core biopsy and a stereotactic biopsy? Well, a core biopsy is is really just the type of tissue that we receive. So it is a cylinder of solid tissue, which is where uh, the radiologist obtains through very diff various different types of uh, core guns that they use. Then they can do that under ultrasound guidance, which most of them are done if the lesion is visible under ultrasound. If you can't see the lesion that's been identified on mammography because remember that most of uh, well essentially in a screening program and we're talking about the the screening program predominantly the lesion will have been picked up on a screening mammogram so that's um, an, an x-ray whereas when they then come back if there's an abnormal lesion and they're brought back to breast screen to be reviewed if there's a need for a biopsy, then the radiologist will look under the ultrasound to see whether they can biopsy it under ultrasound if they can see it. If they can't see it under ultrasound, then they will do it directly under what we call stereotactic guidance, which is into the mammography in using mammography as their guide. So it's it's a different radiological technique. From a pathologist's point of view, we don't see a lot of difference other than 
for some of the calcifications that they do now, they use a larger type of vacuum, they call it vacuum-assisted core biopsy, where they actually use a suction technique as well to get more tissue. So we get a lot more tissue to look at, which is useful, particularly for calcifications. And they're the ones that they usually do under stereotaxis. <laughs> From the core biopsy perspective, uh, what are the common benign conditions we see on biopsies? I guess most of the lesions that um, will present as mass lesions tend to be variants of what we call fibrocystic change, which is a spectrum of proliferative breast disease, which is seen in setting usually um, hormonally driven. Um, so the most common ones would be lesions like fibroadenomas, uh, which are very, very common benign. We regard it as a tumour of the breast um, and in pretty much all ages. Cysts, of course, we talked about earlier, that they're extremely common and they're a manifestation of this fibrocystic change. And a lot of that's driven by what we call metaplastic changes. So they're changes in the forms of the cells. Um, and one of these is apocrine metaplasia, which often makes cysts. And this type of change in cell type um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's malignant or of concern for malignancy and is driven by some sort of changes related to the, the hormone changes in the, in the patient. Um, so they would be the predominant one. And, of course, a lot of these changes, these metaplastic changes in this spectrum may produce calcium within the lumina of the, the cysts, the little cysts, and that's what is seen on radiology. So we receive them as a core biopsy. From the biopsy perspective, what percentage are malignant versus benign? Oh, that's a, that's a difficult <laughs> yeah. question to answer because I think it, it depends on what what target you look actually looking at. I mean, probably from the cases you know, on, a, on a daily basis, and I reported a whole lot of them yesterday morning, and I was thinking about twenty percent of those were malignant, but that will very much depend on a whatever your your target lesion is. If you were looking at mass lesions it will be a higher proportion. If you're looking at calcifications, it'll probably be sitting around 20 to 30%, depending on how the radiologist is graded. If you're looking at cysts, it'll be a very low percent. So one of the breast screen radiologists can probably tell you the exact numbers <laughs> on the proportion of, of malignant cases. I mean, most of them are not malignant, and then we're doing them for reassurance that they are benign and the radiologist is thinking that it is a benign lesion. So to confirm that impression and, as I said, to exclude those sneaky little ones that can sometimes mimic a benign situation uh, when when they're in fact uh, masquerading as um, a malignancy. And what are the common malignant di diagnoses we get from these biopsies? Well, the most common breast cancer is what we call um, an invasive ductal cancer, uh, also known as no special type because it has no, it's not of a special type. And the vast majority, probably about 80, 85% of the cancers will be of that type. And then we have a smaller proportion of lobular cancers. I probably should just make a comment here that if we're talking about malignancy, uh, generally one thinks of that as being an invasive cancer. So it has a malignant behaviour, it has a potential for metastasize, and it's those small cancers that we're really trying to identify at breast screen uh, to prevent them going on to metastasize. But there are also a group of lesions called ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a group of, well, when the malignant cells are present and they show malignant features, but they're confined within a duct space. And these are very commonly picked up at breast screen in a screening setting because they calcify quite often. And therefore, that's one of the other main reasons for doing a screening program is to catch these cells, if you like, before they've managed to escape outside the ducts and have potential for metastasis. So when they're just in situ, and, um, so this ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS, then they don't actually have any potential for metastatic disease. So they're the ones that we can excise um, and then potentially a patient is, is cured if completely excised. So the word carcinoma or malignancy can refer to both of those settings um, and it's important to make that distinction. Now, when we've got biopsies from breast screen and let's say it is a malignant diagnosis, it is an invasive cancer, 
How far do we take that biopsy? Does that mean we do all the immunohistochemistry on it, or does that happen at a later date with the excision? In days gone by, uh, we used to leave all the special stains to once the, speci- uh, the cancer was excised because it was felt that we could have a bigger bit of cancer to look at um, and the patient was going to surgery anyway. Uh, the more cu- um, up-to-date management is currently to look at using neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, in a certain proportion of patients. So this means that they have their chemotherapy, if required, before they have their surgery. So for that reason, we need to do the hormone receptors and so on before we do any surgery. So they're done on the core biopsy to see whether those patients may be uh, appropriate for uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So we'll do hormone receptors for for them, which are estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, and also HER2 receptor, because there's a specific drug that can be targeted for patients with HER2. Sometimes we look at proliferative markers. We also might need to do markers such as to determine whether the tumour really is in situ. Sometimes for pathologists, the distinction between this DCIS, so is it confined within the ducts versus is it showing a little bit of invasion, can be quite tricky. And so we've got some markers we can apply just to confirm that it is in the duct. And sometimes there are other special types of cancer that we might want to confirm that are more unusual types that would have an implication for, for management and so we'll do other markers on that. But as a routine, we'll do the, the receptors, the hormone and the HER2 receptors. Now, is there any conditions that are biopsy benign, but that are still excised uh, later on? Yes, there's quite a few. And a lot of those are because of the either there is a risk that there may be some carcinoma adjacent because they're, they're lesions that show a degree of atypical typical changes. So they may show either architectural changes. One of these is a papillary lesion. So we get little papillomas, which can occur within ducts. And as pathologists, we, we are pretty good at confirming that, yes, this is benign on a core biopsy, but we can't comment on what we can't see. And a proportion of them where they may not have sampled all of the papilloma, a proportion of those may have some atypical changes which may be pre-neoplastic or predisposed to developing neoplasia. So these are generally excised, particularly if they do show definite atypia. There's a little bit of variation in in, uh, management with these lesions, but ideally um, they will be excised. The other lesions that are excised are those that do show atypical changes in the setting of calcifications. So if we have calcifications, there is an atypical hyperplasia Again, we don't know what we can't see. So if there's a broad um, area of calcifications and the biopsies only captured small areas from those calcs, it may be that something else is hiding there. So they'll excise the broader area of the calcifications to be sure. Um, If it was completely benign on the biopsy, then they're happy to leave it alone. Biopsies are always a sample of what is happening in the breast parenchyma. So we're having to anticipate what else is going on there. And then that will drive whether or not further surgery is needed. I think that answers your question. Is that (laughs) what you're asking? Yeah. I am constantly in awe of the detective work that uh, all you medical people do uh, in your field. Um, Wendy, is there any final thoughts or advice you might have for for general practitioners about breast screen, uh, mammography, pathology? It's, It's an area that's I've found fascinating for years and I'm an advocate for breast screening and therefore I would always push for patients to have the screening because we have the potential to pick up these very small changes. From the point of view of the the radiologists, I think, you know, their their techniques are changing and their ability to detect is getting better and better. And some of the problems of this has been created for us is that their their threshold now is, is um, picking some of those very early breast changes, some of the very early what we call pre-neoplastic changes or risk marker changes, um, which are really sitting on that grey zone between is it benign and is it malignant. And sometimes we just can't make a definite diagnosis. Sometimes we just have to say this is atypical, This um, we're concerned about it. So from a pathologist's point of view, we can't always give 
all of the diagnoses from the general practitioner's point of view, I guess, to have some understanding of where there are certainly grey areas still in that diagnostic spectrum, particularly looking at these very early lesions. Very good. Uh, Wendy, uh, as the marketer in the room, one final thing. In the beginning of this uh, interview, you mentioned that the phrase, stick a needle in it, is that a useful <laughs> heuristic in any way, shape or form? Is that a good rule of thumb? <laughs> you mean if there's an abnormal abnormality somewhere? <laughs> yes. Um, we could stick a needle in it. Yes, I, I think... <laughs> There are certain lesions that you can be quite confident are benign on radiology and they've had lots of experience, for example, in a lipoma or some some of these lesions. But if there's any uncertainty, it is certainly worth putting a needle in, whether that be a fine needle to get out some fluid, aspirate fluid, or whether it's a wider bore needle for a core biopsy, because um, it's better safe than sorry. Associate Professor Wendy Raymond, thanks for joining This Medical Life. My pleasure. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts via Twitter. Dr. Travis Brown is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's DR for doctor. And Steve Davis is at Steve Davis. Editing and production is by Tim Whiffen. Design is by Tom Buzzenjut. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.